Hi class, back to um, chapter 13, pediatric hearing loss, and um, we're going to finish out the chapter on this video, and then I think I will begin a second, another video for chapter 14 and finish out in class. So the assessment process. Well, the first part of assessment is almost always referral, right? We talk about this over and over again. The best case scenario is um, that we have early diagnosis um, right at the time of birth or the, the day or two after. If that's not possible, or if it fails to detect a loss, um, or if we're talking about an, a loss acquired later, then follow-up during the preschool years is necessary, um, especially as related to the risk factors. So in other words, a child with greater risk factors should be followed up um, in terms of their hearing even more closely than the typical developing child who will have some form of hearing screening at most well-child visits. Um, referrals are most typically made by a doctor um, or in a lot of cases by an SLP. Um, as I said, it's part of our um, assessment process. So it's considered a referral if we aren't doing the hearing screening and we're referring a child out for that. Or if we are doing the hearing screening as part of our process, then referring the child out to an audiologist for a full hearing assessment. Screenings are done routinely in the public schools in the United States. Um, they're done in doctor's offices as part of well-child visits for preschool children. Um, but in most schools in the state of California, a hearing screening is done every two years um, during the elementary years. I'm not sure how often they're done in junior high and high school. Screenings, um, newborns are typically screened before they leave the hospital, as I said, in most states in the United States, definitely in California. And then older children receive the typical kind of screening schedule. A conventional hearing screening that you've probably all participated in is a form of behavioral testing because it requires a response um, from the child. So typically, only three frequencies are tested, 1,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz, and 4,000 hertz. Um, if a child can pass at a 20 to 25 decibel level, then the screening is considered complete. If not, then a referral is made first to repeat the screening in a couple of weeks, or a referral could be made for a more comprehensive audiological evaluation. I think I said in the last video that we often repeat the screening because one, the child could have been not feeling well that day. Um, the child's behavior might not have been able to be well controlled that day. Um, there could have been a lot of background noise. A screening is typically not done in a noise proof environment, a soundproof environment. Um, so, gosh, again, if we were sitting in class, I would have you all be quiet for a moment and we would listen to all the sounds we could hear around us. And believe it or not, at Cal State Fullerton, it's pretty loud. Um, you've got air conditioning systems. There's a rumble of elevators that you can kind of hear. Um, you're on hard surface floors and you're moving desks around. It's a, it's a loud environment. Um, so you can see why testing is considered passing at 20 to 25 decibels. A comprehensive audiological evaluation. Um, this is not done by us. This is done by an audiologist, um, but it will determine the type and the degree of loss. So is this a conductive hearing loss? Is it a sensory neural hearing loss? Is it a mixed loss? And to what degree? Mild, moderate, severe, profound. And, and that will be discussed in terms of decibels. Um, it will also look at sound, um, excuse me, speech discrimination abilities. So how well can a child discriminate, for example, between minimal pairs? Um, so fish and dish, um, smile and mile, those words that are very similar to each other but differ only by one sound. Um, those can, are typically used as part of speech discrimination testing. Um, it will also look at auditory perception abilities in both quiet and noisy environments. So looking at that signal to noise ratio level. Um, and then any other concerns such as tolerance of loudness. If a significant hearing loss is detected, then follow-up assessment will be done um, to recommend, for example, hearing aids. Um, and that's usually done either by an audiologist or by um, a hearing aid dispenser. Um, similarly, if you're not familiar with it, it's similar to whether you go to an ophthalmologist to 
um, have testing that looks at um, your vision in terms of any medically related um, issue or an optometrist for that hearing testing to prescribe your glasses. So you would go to an audiologist for identifying a, a type and degree of loss and then potentially to a hearing aid dispenser for um, uh, making that recommendation for a prescription for the hearing aids. So what else is included as part of this whole evaluation? So again, this is not necessarily us. This may be the audiologist, although we may be part of this evaluation. The first is the case history and interview. And I'm going to say again, yada, 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 yada. We've talked about this over and over again. A big piece of this one, though, is going to be family history. Um, so looking for those things that will help us identify type of hearing loss and cause of hearing loss or help the audiologist. Um, there will be, um, if, if I, I'm not sure if I put this in your PowerPoints as A, B, C, D, but if I did, that was A, this is B, other interviews and observations. Um, this is where we're going to ask questions about what the child's general listening um, behaviors are, what their strengths and needs are in different contexts. So, um, you know, looking at uh, what environments the child needs to be using their hearing in, what environments they need to be communicating in. Um, the third part of this comprehensive audiologic or comprehensive hearing assessment will be otoscopic examination. Oto, O-T-O, scopic, one word, otoscopic. Um, this is done for one primary reason. It's done for a couple of reasons, but one primary, to make sure there's a clear auditory canal. That's the primary reason. So it's going to look to see if there are any abnormalities in the outer or middle ear, um, but it's to ensure that that auditory canal is clear before we proceed with sound testing. So is there a buildup of wax there that needs to be addressed first? Is, does everything um, look, good, look good from the outside toward the, toward the tympanic membrane? I'm also going to take a look at that tympanic membrane. Is it that pearly translucent color? Can you see, uh, for example, um, when you're doing otoscopic examination, you can see um, a shadow of the bones on that tympanic membrane. So can you see that or does it look red and inflamed and maybe um, not at the right um, um, shape that it should be, Is there, which would indicate that perhaps there's infection behind it. So that's otoscopic examination. Again, the primary reason for that is to make sure that canal is clear before we do sound testing because that's D, the next part, audiometry. So audiometry, there's a couple different types of tests that we're going to do with a child, but the, the, the most essential is that pure tone testing. So this is, again, a behavioral measure. Typically, it's going to depend on the child's cooperation um, and their participation. They're going to need to repeat words or respond to different tones by raising a hand or pushing a button. If they can't participate at that level, if this is just a, too young a child and behaviorally we can't get them to do that, um, or if this is a child with, say, um, some intellectual deficiencies or um, significant levels of autism, we may do what's called play audiometry. Um, that'll be attempted. So instead of raising their hand or pushing down on a a button to say, yeah, I heard that sound. We may use things like pegboards. So put a peg in the board every time you hear a sound or drop this block in a bucket if you hear the sound. Or sometimes just even training the child to look at a source of sound um, each time that they hear something or to look in a direction um, and then they get a reward. And I'll tell you, if you've never seen this, it's really cool. Um, so you're in a soundproof booth and in the corners, um, they usually the kids can't see them until they absolutely need them. But they're those little toys that that um, like a stuffed animal that has um, symbols and they play the symbols or they do a little dance or, you know, that can be animated. And what they train the child to do is they it's, it's operant conditioning. It's they present a sound and then they turn on the little toy so that the child looks for the little toy and is rewarded with that. 
and you train the child in that so that by the time you've conditioned their behavior, now you can present a tone and the child will look before anything happens and then be rewarded. So you know that, yes, they've heard it because now they turned their head and looked. So that's all part of play audiometry, but it is all pure tone testing. Um, it is done in, as I said, a sound treated room or a sound treated booth. Um, the te it tests the full range of frequencies. Remember I said in screening, we're only looking at 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. Well, now we're going to look at everything from about 125 hertz, which is a very, very low pitch sound, up to 8,000 hertz. Um, it will look at intensities from as soft as negative 10 decibels up to as loud as 110 decibels. Um, sound is typically delivered through headphones, but if it can't, it will be delivered through, if a child won't tolerate them, um, it will be delivered through speakers, sometimes through a small vibratory device placed on the mastoid bone, so the bone right here behind the ear. Um, if we're doing that, we're, we're doing bone conduction testing as opposed to pure air conduction testing. Um, you are all going to have to take an introduction to audiology, audiology course. So we are going to skip, if you're following along in your chapter, we're going to skip the how to read an audiogram piece here um, and move um, on in your text. But recall in your last video, I did ask you to look at those sample audiograms um, on pages 459 and 460 in your textbook. They have some really good information. One about how an audiogram is structured and then about those sound levels um, for speech. So take a look at those, please. Other objective measures. So pure tone testing was a behavioral measure. Um, but as opposed to behavioral measures, we have objective measures. Um, these do not require a response from the child. The child is a passive participant in these. Um, um, some of them are actually done while the child is in a light sleep state. So the first one is called imitance testing, M with an I, I-M-M-I-T-T, -I -I -T -T, imitance testing. It, the term imitance is the flow of energy through the middle ear. Admittance is the forward flow of energy, so it's not impeded. Impedance is the oppositional, uh, oppositional energy against that flow. Okay, so those three terms. Emittance, the flow of energy through. Admittance is forward movement. Impedance is oppositional energy against the flow. So in emittance testing, the audiologist is looking at the vibratory movement of the tympanic membrane. Um, this testing is, well, tympanometry is one measure of that movement. It's graphed onto a tympanogram, not to be mistaken with an audiogram. Okay, children with conductive hearing loss, so middle ear hearing loss, will have an abnormal tympanogram. They're going to have abnormal admittance, that forward flow of energy through the middle ear, right? Um, emittance, excuse me, through the middle ear. And let's back up again. Children with conductive hearing loss will have an abnormal tympanogram because tympanometry is measuring movement of sound. Children with a sensory neural hearing loss will have a normal tympanogram. Sound is moving through the middle ear. Okay, so there is no impedance through the middle ear to sound. Those are a lot of terms in one definition for emittance testing. Just remember the terms I want you to know. Emittance, flow of energy through the middle ear, and it's the name of the testing. Admittance, forward flow of energy. Impedance, opposition to that forward flow. Tympanometry is the name of the actual test that we use to measure movement of the tympanic membrane. And that's how we're measuring emittance, okay? Acoustic emission testing. 
This is when sound is introduced into the ear canal using earbuds. So just like you guys used to listen to music, we're going to put earbuds in to introduce sound. So not a big headset, earbuds. The sensory cells in the, this is just so cool, you guys. The sensory cells in the cochlea, those little hair cells. I think I might've mentioned this to you back in the anatomy chapter. They produce an audible byproduct in response to sound. Okay, so sound is introduced. Now we're in the cochlea and those little hair cells go, ooh, I hear something, yay. They produce some little audible byproduct. These can be detected and recorded within the ear canal. Okay, so if a hearing loss is suspected and we've ruled out any conductive loss, then this testing is used to determine if the cochlea is also impaired or if it is intact. So the otoacoustic emission, the OAE, will be abnormal or will be absent if the cochlea is involved. Okay. The next test is called evoked auditory potential. And this tests the nervous system's response to sound stimulation. So now we're looking at that auditory nerves response specifically. This is not a test of hearing acuity, but it's a test of the integrity of the whole auditory pathway. So tones are delivered to the ears by headphones. Brain activity is recorded via electrodes attached to the head. So this is a test that is typically done when a child is in like a twilight sleep. So we've had, we're not doing this. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure that an audiologist can do this. I don't, I, I'm going to guess they can't. And I'm sorry, I don't have the great answer for that. Um, um, this is a medical testing because a child has to be put into kind of a twilight sleep um, in order to do this test. Again, we're going to skip a portion in your book. We're going to, and if I've skipped it completely, you don't have to know it. Um, we're going to skip the portion regarding hearing aid evaluation um, on the evaluation of assistive technology regarding hearing loss. Just know that as an SLP, you're not going to be participating in that evaluation for hearing aids. However, you will be introduced to the fundamentals of that in your um, introduction to audiology, and then you'll be introduced to the fundamentals of hearing aid care. I think I've said before, you're going to be often the person on an elementary school campus that's best um, equipped and trained to deal with hearing aids, the kids on the campus with hearing aids. Um, I would suggest if you have the opportunity, I don't know that it's a requirement in graduate school for you, but to take an advanced audiology course, I would certainly suggest you do that. Prescribing a hearing aid is extremely complicated. It's just not just a matter of a good fit in the ear and then providing amplification. It is truly an individual prescription like glasses. I couldn't take my glasses off and hand them to you and expect them to work for you. Um, it needs to take into account that complete audiological profile. So that's all you need to know about that right now. Accurate diagnosis of hearing loss is vital because amplification improperly provided can do far more damage than it does good. Um, failure to identify hearing loss at as young an age as possible can lead to lifelong consequences. So how is pediatric hearing loss treated? The overarching goal of intervention for pediatric hearing loss is the development of healthy, socially, and emotionally balanced individuals who are able to integrate fully into society and lead productive lives. Achieving this goal off, um, uh, is often dependent on the extent to which these children can form meaningful, sensitive relationships. That, ca that capability relates to their sense of identity and the way they relate to the world around them back to that word attachments that I introduced way back in chapter one. Underlying all of this, but of greater significance is the fact that there's a window of opportunity for language development before the age of five years that must be captured. 
an infant's brain is not wired to prefer auditory or visual language. Um, it's wired for communication development. It's wired to develop language, but it doesn't prefer visual spoke. I mean, spoken language over visual language. There is a current push, um, and there's even proposed legislation, some of which may have been passed recently, to assure that deaf children are exposed to sign language as soon as possible. That doesn't mean they will all have to be uh, visual communicators, but they need that language development to happen as soon as possible, children with profound hearing loss. Um, early identification. Again, we have to make choices about, excuse me, about manual or um, oral communication systems. Children are not taught, ch typically developing children are not taught speech and language. We talked about this back in the chapter on development. They learn it by being immersed through incidental learning and exposure. They hear their caregivers talking, right? Children with prelingual hearing loss will not develop speech and language on their own. They need significant amounts of intervention. So now, again, parents very early have to decide if their child is going to be an oral communicator, relying on speech and um, amplification as much as possible, and perhaps lip reading training, or if they're going to be completely manual translators, they only use sign language, um, or if they're going to use a total communication system. So the use of hearing amplification, some training in speech reading, and some provision of speech services, but also learning sign language. Um, back when I was sitting in your seats in Orange County, within our Orange County educational system, we had Taft School for the Hearing Impaired in the Santa Ana Unified School District um, as the place that, that the kids with very profound hearing losses received their education. Um, and they used a total communication model. I don't know that they are still doing that. Amplification and listening devices, hearing aids. Children are typically, typically wear the traditional behind the ear hearing aids. And this is not because we want to make them visible. We're not being mean to kids. Um, it's because they're sturdier. Uh, they, they're harder to break. Um, and we're talking about children, right? Um, they make them now, by the way, in really cool colors. You can get really cool um, like superhero designs printed on them. So they're trying to make them more and more acceptable, um, at least in kids' eyes. Um, but behind the ear hearing aids are much preferred. And one of the reasons besides being sturdier is the ear mold is flexible which makes the whole device much more damage resistant. It also makes it last longer because you can keep the same hearing aid and just change the mold that, that fits in the ear um, as the child grows. The batteries last longer in a behind the ear, ear model and a behind the ear model can be fit with tamper resistant battery doors and tamper resistant volume controls. So you can see that all of those things make them um, preferable for use with children. Um, assist, we'll talk about the different types of hearing aids when we get to adults. Assistive listening devices. Um, the most commonly used within school systems is called an FM system. Um, and it can be used with or without hearing aids. It's a radio, sig radio wave signal that's sent from a speaker's microphone, so the teachers fit with a microphone, and it's sent directly to a listener's receiver, either their specific um, hearing aid or to a desktop speaker that they have right in front of them. Um, and that's been traditionally what we've used in schools uh, as long as I've worked in schools, our FM systems. Um, more and more schools now are being fitted with a sound field amplification system. So again, the teacher is wearing a microphone, but her voice or his voice is amplified throughout the classroom. So every child in the classroom is getting the benefit of always being able to hear the teacher's voice at the same loudness level, 
regardless of where the teacher is standing in the classroom. The teacher doesn't isn't confined to standing at a uh, microphone at a desk either. They're wearing um, a sound field um, amplification system and can walk around the room. Now, a child with a significant hearing loss may still need an FM system on top of that sound field system, but those are both assistive listening devices. And then cochlear implants. Um, these are surgically placed devices that provide direct stimulation to the auditory nerve. We only use these um, in children with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. There's an external microphone um, that's picking up sound that you see on the child. It's easier to see on a little boy because usually they cut their hair, but it's put right here behind the ear and um, little girls can cover them better with their hair. Um, an external microphone, there's a speech processing device and a transmitter deliver. They deliver information um, to an internally implanted electrode that's um, implanted in the turns of the cochlea. These devices immediately restore access to sound as soon as they're turned on. They do not ensure understanding of speech and language. They restore access to sound. It is not the same sound as you and I are both hearing sitting here. Um, it is it's a very different sound, um, the child will have to learn to recognize that sound as speech and then that's translate that speech into language. Um, extensive testing must be done to assure that a child is a good candidate for this, um, not just their hearing testing, but also just behavioral measures. And um, But once that has been established, implantation should be done as early as um, possible in the period of language development so that the child can get the best benefit from that cochlear implant. Um, and then oral rehabilitation, not the same oral, O-R-A-L, but aural, A-U-R-A-L, oral rehabilitation. And this is where we find ourselves um, much more involved in um, the rehabilitation process related to hearing impairment. The aim of oral rehabilitation is to help an individual with hearing loss to achieve fluent communication in either a manual or oral, more oral spoken or manual modality. Typically a good oral, A-U-R-A-L, rehabilitation program involves the following pieces. Uh, reception and comprehension of language, speech and voice production, auditory training, um, which is helping the person make the most use of the hearing that they have um, and by a lot of different means, speech reading or visual cues, and then communication strategies, education and counseling, family and caregiver um, participation in counseling, and then any follow-up service. So that's all part of an oral rehabilitation program. Um, one of the things we do with families is to help um, ensure an appropriate listening environment. And that's things like turning off the unwatched television, running loud appliances like dishwashers overnight, um, having carpeting or rugs on floors at homes and in schools. And I know a lot of people hate carpeting, but if you have a person living in your home with a hearing impairment, um, it's a sound dampening. It, it reduces all the noise in that signal to noise ratio. Um, tennis balls on chair feet if we have to have hard surface floors. So you slice open a tennis ball and stick it on the feet of the chair. Um, having draperies, they absorb sound. Um, or putting sound absorbent material on walls. Um, Maximizing audition, so maximizing hearing, we need to do daily checks of hearing devices. And as I told you in the public schools, you are often the person best suited to have the child's extra batteries in your desk drawer. Um, and then things like acoustic highlighting. This is using a slower rate of speech, not a slow rate of speech, a slower rate of speech. Um, making sure that you are communicating by being close to your communicative partner. 
increasing your pitch and rhythm of your speech. Again, not, not overemphasizing, but just making sure that there is melody in your speech. Um, increasing some repetition or redundancy in your message. So um, saying things in more than one way, using shorter sentences, um, an emphasis on key words. So you may need to write something down, um, um, just a key word to, to establish context, for example. Emphasis on unstressed function words. Emphasis on words toward the end of a sentence where our voice tends to fall off. All right, I kind of blasted through that last part. That's all things that we would do to maximize residual hearing or maximize communicative attempts. All right, that is the end of the chapter for pediatric hearing loss. Our next video will be the beginning of the chapter on adult loss.